Our next speaker is Christian Matello. Dr. Matello is a professor at the Salk Institute for Biological Studies and adjunct professor of bioengineering at UC San Diego. Thank, thanks for the introduction. And I want to thank the organizers for this opportunity to, uh, to speak to you today. I'm going to be talking about uh, metabolic mechanisms, and I'll, I'll be discussing how we apply metabolomic flux analysis to understand disease mechanisms. And I'll talk about a, a, an odd, an interesting disease case study focused on metabolic mechanism affecting the balance of non essential amino acids in patients and how this can be a driver of disease. So my disclosures quickly, the most relevant funding here is the LA Medical Research Institute. And then I, my, my lab aims to understand the metabolic mechanisms driving disease. The, the general approach that we take is to apply structures to different biological systems, apply targeted mass spectrometry to quantify the enrichment and metabolite abundance, and use uh, models of, of, of varying size, particularly on simpler size, to understand how metabolism is a number of different areas of interest, ranging from cancer metabolism, branch chain amino acid metabolism, and diabetes. They all focus on our work covering neuropathy and disease called Axel. Uh, my background is as a chemical engineer, and, and one point I, I'd like to make in introducing our work is that our bodies tend to behave much more like chemical plants than they do with an enzyme. A lot of the tools and approaches we use to the chemical plant actually can be applied readily to the human system, breaking down the process into different unit operations so we can understand what happens. I'm, I'm sorry to cut in, but Dr. Metallo, you're breaking up a little bit. And if you could be closer, maybe we okay. can hear better. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Much better. Okay. So we need to understand these uh, robust, uh, genetically evolved biochemical engineering mechanisms in order to exploit them therapeutically or through the diet. So... Uh, the overarching question, maybe for this workshop, is can precision nutrition or personalized nutrition be used to mod modulate health? And the oversimplified answer is absolutely if we have all the pieces together. So there's going to be components of precision nutrition and precision medicine that are both needed. And nutrition is ultimately going to be inherently imprecise. This digestive system has been engineered and evolved to minimize the fluctuations that arise as food is taken in and processed by the gut, GI tract, and, and, and through the circulation. Dietary manipulations, be it good or bad, as we'll see, uh, are going to be mitigated by the system. The system is going to work against us. This also tells me, as an engineer, that nutritional science is, is really challenging and that it requires diverse expertise. Uh, whereas the NIH is actually built on disease states, you need to be a jack of all trades to really understand what's happening to your food. So, although it's probably the basis of most of my, my data today, static metabolite measurements only get you so far. Understanding the dynamics of these processes and their location is critical. So I'm going to share with you today a specific case study on, on a set of diseases that, that we have been studying for a couple of years now in a particular metabolic pathway. So the, the disease macular telangiectasia is a disease of, of the macula. This is the, the part of your eye responsible for your high visual acuity and has most accounts for most of the neurological activity. It's called the telangiectasia because of uh, the vascular abnormalities observed by fluorescein angiogram. But 
we now know it's much more uh, specific than, than a vascular defect. Uh, there's a large genetic component, uh, and it's a familial disease, and it's estimated to impact uh, MACTEL uh, about one in every one to 2,000 patients. You get central vision loss. Uh, the nice way to think about it is it's early onset uh, macular disease where it can hit patients in their 40s or, or even in their 20s. So I got involved a couple of years ago with the folks involved in the MACTEL project. Uh, this started in 2005 and uh, money was put forth uh, by the Lowy family to try to understand the causes of, of this disease. So they brought together an international group of scientists and clinicians, and there has been a heavy genomic fo focus over the years. So in a, a study published uh, before I was involved, uh, Melanie Ballo's group identified several uh, GWAS hits that were focused on the serine biosynthesis pathway. And what they observed was that serine and glycine were lower in MACTEL patients compared to controls. So the subsequent question was, why are serine and glycine metabolically important? They're used for a lot of things, and I don't want to walk through all the details. Uh, serine is predominantly synthesized from carbohydrates uh, via glycolysis, though within the periphery, much of serine and glycine, uh, serine is derived from glycine through liver and kidney metabolism. They give rise to numerous uh, downstream metabolites. So one of the approaches uh, we took to ask why is serine important in this disease state, uh, we went back to that example uh, of what happens in a test tube. So how do cells control flux of a substrate to different pathways. And one of the ways we've evolved to do this is through, uh, through engineering enzymes. And the Michaelis constant, uh, constant KM depicted here for different serine utilizing enzymes tells us what the affinity is for an enzyme to its substrate, serine. Now, even if we feed uh, mice a serine glycine free diet, the tissue concentrations remain in the 50 to 250 micromolar concentration right here. So what it means is these enzymes, which are some of the most important enzymes in the body, are always, it should be loaded by serine in pretty much all cases. And it's these enzymes down here that represent the sweet spot. we have focused on serine palmitol transferase because it's ubiquitously, ex ubiquitously expressed and sphingolipids themselves are important for neurological function. So we hypothesized that maybe at SPT alterations, it, it is, has it's, it's tuned its KM such that it's sensitive to, to serine levels. So serine palmitol transferase uh, catalyzes the biosynthesis of sphingolipids. These are bioactive lipids. Uh, I like to think of it as linking amino acid metabolism to, to membrane biology. Uh, but what's also been learned recently is that it can also act promiscuously. And if serine levels are low or, or there's specific mutations in subunits of SPT, you can use alanine to generate deoxysphingolipids. And these lack the hydroxy group, which is necessary for phosphorylation or further modification. So deoxysphingolipids uh, uh, are formed when an alanine is used. These were first identified as endogenous metabolites in HSAN1 patients in 2009, in which in those patients have severe peripheral neuropathy and loss of thermal sensing. Uh, more recently, a couple, so we, we attempted to measure serine and, and deoxysphingolipids in this MACTEL cohort and confirm that serine levels were down, but we also saw that deoxysphingolipids were higher. And we noted that clinically, uh, some, but not all HSAN1 patients do have MACTEL. If we look at the broader cohort mixing controls and patients, we see that we, we observe that there is a strong correlation between alanine and deoxysphingolipid levels and serine, a, a negative correlation with serine. And you see these patients in red here are HSAN1. So they're the outliers, uh, which always synthesize high levels of deoxysphingolipids. In, uh, 
even in the presence of high levels of serine. So we wanted to ask, can we drive this neurological phenotype by manipulating the diet? So we fed mice a uh, serine glycine free diet, a child background, and observed that after 10 months on that serine glycine free diet, they lost thermal sensing as measured by a hot plate assay, and they, they exhibited some retinal defect. So many mice don't have a macula, which makes it a little bit challenging to study the specific really highlights that the same phenotype that can be driven by, by genetics can be driven by, by, by an odd atypical. So the genetic landscape is now starting to become clear about MACTEL, and MACTEL is emerging as a disease of dysregulated amino acid metabolism, in particular steering and glycine. More recently, we, we uh, collaborated with the uh, Rando Alekmet's lab and, and Marty Friedlander, doing a deeper dive into MACTEL genetics and then identify that PHGDH haploinsufficiency. So it's enriched in the MACTEL code. PHGDH is a rate limiting step for serine synthesis, particularly in the nervous system. So what we're seeing now is that there's several lines of evidence, GWAS, specific coding variants, linked to serine in this MACTEL code. So in the frame of precision nutrition, this is almost as good as it gets. It's not. It's definitely not a monogenic disease, but there's a particular metabolic phenotype. And in this larger cohort that we've more recently analyzed and unpublished data, we again see serine levels are down, glycine levels even more so, and alanine levels are significantly elevated in the MACL population. So some of the next questions that we've been trying to ask, it, particularly focused on the relevance to, to nutrition is, what dietary factors or other factors might further influence these, these phenotypes, either exacerbating or mitigating? Furthermore, are there, are there, common, are there links to more common diseases? Because this is a fairly rare disease, uh, but there are common diseases like type diabetes where comorbidities are reminiscent of what's observed in that. And I'm not going to go through the details here, but this is a paper published in 2013 that really works walks uh, comparatives and epidemiological uh, data on the MACTEL cohort, and they found that there's clear links to diabetes and it increases uh, the, the odds ratio that you might experience MACTEL. So we asked, can we try to accelerate this peripheral neuropathy? be additional types of manipulation. So we applied the more of a Western diet uh, using a, a KCAL high fat diet, and lard, lard is a major fat source. Had a high fat diet, control arm, or a serine glycine free high fat diet. Try to further promote this pathway as, as the saturated fat uh, ease this. And multiple, and what we were able to see remarkably now using the Hargraves Hargraves test, which is a little bit more accurate in quantifying thermal latency, we see that in just four months on a serine glycine free high fat diet, we can see that neuropathy, whereas it took eight months before for that to emerge. We also wanted to see can we turn this around, and instead of promoting the pathway with a high fat diet. Can we mitigate flux through deoxysphingolipid biosynthesis by administering miriosin, which is a general inhibitor of, of SPT? And this, this works and is survivable because uh, our cells have the ability to avoid bases from the diet. And remarkably, you, you can see now in the full cohort that a low fat diet. With steering, with lacking serine and glycine does not induce peripheral neuropathy. That remains a base time, baseline. Same, same for high fat. Miriosin, however, does attenuate that peripheral neuropathy phenotype that emerges with steering glycine high fat diet. 
So one of the concepts that we're that we're starting to think through it comes actually from from cancer field. This one hit, two hit oncogene. What seems to be happening here is we have as we move to the refined diets. In the case of the high fat diet and the serine glycine free low fat diet, we're seeing a metabolic imbalance, and well that impact use the nervous, the peripheral nervous system stays intact and, and can handle that one hit. But then when we double down and have serine glycine free on a high fat diet background, there's too much and that pushes you into that metabolic catastrophe. So if I step back and think about that, that uh, digestive process and some of the approaches and how we're trying to understand this further, what we see is Remarkably, and the, the high fat diet alone reduces serine and glycine levels in the feces, which is the best metric of, that we have for, for a microbiome metabolite. Colon, liver, and then most tissues aside from a dead end tissue like EWAT show reductions in serine and or glycine even on a, a high fat diet. And this is exacerbated when we reduce it further. Also, interestingly, the, the alpha diversity increases on the glycine low fat diet, suggesting there is some mechanism, whereas, frankly, there's more of an impact between low fat diet and high fat than there is between high fat diet and high fat diet. Now, and these changes correlate with the actual single lipid abundances, but also highlight what's not shown here is that there's a general dyslipidemia driven by the diet, which is part of that. So just to step back for a moment, this is a pretty severe and extreme diet. And we can talk about how it and for nutritional intake. But what about a normal diet in a more common diabetes model? And in this case, we turn to the DBDB BKS leptin receptor dependent model, which become diabetic on a normal child diet. They get morbid, morbidly obese, and they experience a, a more complete form of peripheral neuropathy. And you can see that here; they have a again increase in thermal latency. So, what we've done in this case is try to do metabolic phenotyping, understand how is the metabolism functioning in different tissues. And might this be the driver for low serine and glycine? And I won't go through the details here, but we do see that liver shows significant reductions in glycine, serine, and methionine. And gene expression uh, data analysis really demonstrates that serine and glycine disposal is upregulated, where their, their biosynthesis is downregulated. So we wanted to ask a question. If we do, if we are looking at a, a situation where some diabetics may experience serine deficiency, can we find an assay that can identify this? The same way that the glucose tolerance test is used on insulin resistance, one of the approaches we're taking now is to explore whether a serine tolerance test can look at whether or not a patient or an animal might be predisposed to dispose of all its serine. So shown here, you can see that we get a nice peak in the blood, it comes down the wild type animals, but the diabetic mice really just show minimal intake and maintenance of serine level, which is relevant because serine supplementation is an approach used by a number of different uh, clinical trials and, and diseases with that, I just want to summarize. We have a disease which can we can drive by manipulating the environment or the diet, but it has clear genetic components which impact biological function. So what we're starting to think of is is metabolic syndrome some is tuning metabolism in such a way to reduce serine levels and cause peripheral neuropathy associated with serine deficiency in some patients, reminiscent of one of these uh, serine apathies, which we're starting to, to identify and understand more. So with that, I just want to thank uh, folks.
for the time. And I just want to point out uh, Michael Hanslick and Jiminy Ganga Tharin, who wish for most of this work. What years with the Mac album? Thank you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Matello, for highlighting how understanding metabolic networks can be used to provide the right patient the right dietary approach to treat the right disease.